My name is Chris Dima, and how's the camera showing? How's it going? Forgot to tell you, you're on live, YouTube, television-ish kind of thing. Sure. Have you heard of YouTube? Yes. Yeah. So, it live streams so people who aren't here can watch. Good. And we also have Mike Ludermoser doing second camera. These things are running too. So. And I'm holding my mic. And you're holding your mic. <laughs> So this is Evelyn Swenson, everybody. Let's give a round of applause for coming and getting involved. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And let me say a couple words about while she laughs, and then I'll do a little intro, and then really let you do it, because that's the whole point, to tell a story, a captivating story. Um, so while she laughs, there's three things, co-working, events like this, and we have an incubator. Uh, the co-working is 300 bucks a month, and you get a desk and no contracts, and you get a fast internet, coffee, beer, and a bathroom. What else do you need? Mm -hmm. And you get to bump, rub elbows with uh, funky people like <laughs> Henry. And that's good because if you're in the basement doing your own thing, that can get kind of old. Right, Peter? Yeah. <laughs> We've all been there. So if you want to try it out, we also. You twist our arm, we have a secondary membership if you're just a satellite and you come here once a week like Mark. But we appreciate the support. Um, the events, this is called the Startup Meetup. This is number 27. We haven't missed since we, since we started in January. And it was just kind of a, hey, uh, let's, let's do some content or something. And it's worked out. We've had some really amazing people come through and we have a lot more people to come through. And next week, then, is Stephen DePaul from Pulhada. Yes, Stephen DePaul is a guy with a day job who had a great idea for building an app that allowed people to pool lottery tickets. So I guess in offices, people pool lottery tickets. And it's totally analog, like, and word of mouth, or handshake trust. So he, he built an app that lets you to do it so you can keep track of it and you can build these mega pools and kind of uh, enhance your risk opportunity or reduce your risk uh, in the lottery game. And he got through all the legal hurdles at the state level and almost got acquired by a big gaming company, but then there was an M&A and they just dropped him because there were more important things to do. And the week after that? The week after that is Dance Co., which includes MB Corp., um, Sarah Haggerty from B Corp., and Mandy Cabot from Dance Co. So this is pretty awesome. Uh, I've been trying to get B Corporation in. They're a quasi-governmental organization. It's not, they won't describe it like that, but that's the best I can do right now. They evaluate your business for its ability to be kind to the environment and kind to humanity. So Patagonia is a big corporation. I think most of you probably know that. And they're actually based out of uh, Wayne. And so then I met somebody who knew the founder of Dansko, and Dansko was the first B corporation ever. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if I could get somebody? And it turns out the CEO accepted our invitation, the founder not only the CEO, but the founder. And she was not only ahead of her time to set up Dance Co. the Corp, but she was the first, she was in the first class of women at Harvard. So she, she'll be an interesting person to talk to. I hope you can come up, up, out for that. And do we have some folks we don't want to go too far into uh, the future? One more, Dana Hoffer. Uh, after that? Yeah. Dana Hoffer, uh, and all this stuff is on our website. Dana Hoffer is the uh, chief of engineering of a company called Gyrobike, and it's the most amazing thing, and it's close to my heart because I'm going through teaching two kids to ride bikes right now. The front wheel is solid, and it's got a gyroscope in it, and you can actually take a little kid's bike and send it across this room without a kid on it, and it will go straight. And so you get this kid on there with full gyroscope, and It'll stay upright as long as it's moving. And then you can dial back the gyro scope, um, and he can teach a kid to ride a bike in 15 minutes. And adults with 
balance issues, and even MS can ride, the, ride bikes with the assistance of the gyros, gyro scope inside the front wheel. So that's a pretty awesome thing. They had a Kickstarter for 100,000, I think they're at 200,000. And it's an international company, so pretty interesting. The second uh, event is Night Owls, Wednesday night, 7 to 10. We're starting to do content, like a half hour, 45 minute demo. Peter LeBeau, the who? Le LeBeau. Um, my alter ego is a French man, sorry. Uh, he demoed his calendar app last week, so uh, if anybody's got interest in demoing something, Night Owls is it. Mark, are you doing this week? I am. Awesome viewer. Uh, dot com, pay per view for your video. And the incubator, we have two companies going strong in that. And I think that's it. So, Evelyn, the introduction I can do is that I run a marketing company out of. Um, Out of here, I'm a co-working, uh, I'm a tenant too, and a landlord. Uh, and through that I met an interesting man named Jim Thompson who runs Commonwealth Books. And he publishes books like Evelyn's book, My Life with Music. And I started doing just social media for him and met Evelyn and she's local and he's not. And Evelyn's story was really compelling. She raised six kids and four. Four. Well, four. Anything over four, three to me is. Six. Two boys, two yeah. girls, okay. And then went at 40 and got two degrees from Westchester University and then had a prolific uh, career in, in music. And when I met her in person, it was, I know you're 85? And I was just impressed with her vigor and that she's still a creator. And I thought it's a perfect fit for Startup Meetup. Every once in a while I try to bring in something that's non-technology, but that is wholly innovation. And in my head, it's about having a, a life that's robust, a, a creative life, right? If you're either creating or you're accreting or the opposite of that. So. She's going to talk about whatever she wants to talk about, and we're going to have a lively Q&A, and I think that will all come out better than when you came in. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Does anybody know who this fellow is? Is that Caesar? That's a good guess, yeah. Well, as I tell my story, you'll find out, because he has a tie with Westchester because he came from Italy when he was 16 years old and he came to Curtis in Philadelphia and he didn't know any English and his mother just dropped him here and went off with somebody else and got married in South America and he roomed with a um, famous composer from Westchester. Does everybody know who that is? Samuel Barber. Samuel Barber. And the first time he came to Westchester, it was in the summertime, and he came to, uh, had a picnic on the Brandywine River. Well, that ties in with how I met, this is Giancarlo Minotti, and he wrote a Christmas opera that maybe you know about because it was the first one written for television, and it was called Amal and the Night Visitors. And it's about a little boy in, uh, in, uh, and the three kings are coming on their way to see the baby Jesus, and he gives him the, them his crutch, saying he might need it, and then he's cured. <coughs> and so that's been on television every year uh, since like 1950, something like that. I've even forgotten the date. But um, I'll start with my beginning of my story, and then tell you how I met him and how it made a big impression and a big boost to my own career. I was born in a small town in Virginia. How many people here are from Westchester that, that have always lived here? Yeah, good. Uh, anybody from Delaware? Good one. Anybody from Virginia? South Carolina? Florida? Georgia? Uh, Kansas? 
Arkansas, Tennessee. I've lived in all those places. <laughs> And so that's another reason how I had so many stories to tell because every place I went, I met interesting people and I did interesting things. Um, I was born in a small town in Virginia, Woodstock, Virginia, not Woodstock, the other Woodstock. <laughs> and my publisher now is Woodstock, Illinois. So <laughs> somebody said I should call my book Woodstock to Woodstock. <laughs> but anyway, um, there was nothing going on in that town except the Rotary Club had a talent show once a year and I made my debut singing at age six in the only theater in town. And I took piano lessons and uh, my parents did not have enough money to buy a piano. My mother's parents lost all their money in the stock market crash and so they came to live with us and they had 10 children. Two of them were still in high school, so they came to live with us too. I mean, we actually had all those people to feed, and my father said, we don't have enough money for a piano. So my mother took me to a piano teacher, and I got a piano book, and in the back, it had a cardboard keyboard, which we cut out and we pasted it on the desk, and that's how I started. But within a year, when I was nine years old, I won a state competition in piano. And when I was 10, I won again, and 11, I won again. And that year, there was a man who was a judge who taught piano at Hollins College in Roanoke, Virginia. And he said, well, Miss Dickinson, uh, when you grow up, uh, I'd like you to come to Hollins and study piano with me. And I did. <laughs> but between then, there was a Second World War and he went into the army, my father went into the army. So that's why I lived in all those different places. I was with my father when it, he was getting his training in the army and then he fought in the Second World War. Well, out of that came the fact that my father's unit liberated Luxembourg. And when they were celebrating their 60th anniversary of the liberation of Luxembourg, I got an email from the government of Luxembourg saying, would you please come and represent your father? And so I did, and my sister and I went, and I sang at the American Cemetery there. And um, in the 30s, my father played polo with George Patton. He was in the cavalry then. And George was a major, my dad was a lieutenant. But after that, uh, um, in the Second World War, he was in the Second Armored Division in tanks. So when I went to sing in Luxembourg, well, his uh, General Patton's granddaughter was there, and I said, and what are you doing now? And he, she said, well, I married a German doctor, and I'm living in Germany. And I said, how did that happen? And she said, well, um, my husband's father was a young German officer who was captured uh, by the Russians, and he was... <laughs> Uh, to be shot by a firing squad and they had their guns at the ready and George Patton came in and said stop the Americans are here and it saved his life and so all the time they corresponded and finally their children married each other see I mean so every chapter in my book has an interesting story like that that you would just never imagine could happen um, well, after Woodstock, then I lived at all those towns. When I got to Nashville, do you know that was called the Athens of the South? Uh, there was only one Saturday night at Ryman Auditorium that they had country music. And I went to a girls boarding school called Ward Belmont, which is now Belmont University in Nashville. And uh, my niece's husband is now the director of education at that university. But um, we went from, from Arkansas and my mother said, well, we have to find a place to live. Well, this was in the middle of the war. She saw an empty house and said, well, who owns that property? And they said, well, it's um, the university and it's only for married students. So my mother went down and signed up. <laughs> and she took creative writing and she played the violin. And so um, I had a wonderful time at Ward Belmont. And, and you know, they call that a finishing school, but it was my beginning school. Because they gave me credit for going to every concert. 
and in the first three months I went to 30 concerts and got credit for all of them and in my book is a list. I have the programs still and they're all like uh, the Trap family singers were making their first concert tour and later on I met Maria Von Trapp, and now I do Famous Women, 12, for the Delaware Humanities Forum, and I go in costume and tell my life story, and I, I'm Maria Von Trapp as a grandmother, and I tell all about what happened to her before The Sound of Music and after The Sound of Music, and then I even say, which was true, that uh, she came to lecture at um, Wilmington, Delaware, and I went up and introduced myself, and then I say in my talk, as though I'm um, this famous woman. Uh, and you know, I, it's so nice to be back in Delaware because I remember last time I was here, I met this woman, I think she had a sort of a Swedish name, and she said she had heard my family sing in Nashville, Tennessee in 1943. Can you imagine that? <laughs> so I have a way of just putting in little bits about famous people that I have met. So it's, it's a lot of fun because I do Mrs. Washington and Mrs. Lincoln and um, a, a lot of, oh, and, and, and Anna Leah Owens from The King and I. She had a fabulous career before and after. She was only in Siam for four years. So um, she ended up in Canada and started an art school. I mean, you just never know what these women are going to do, but I get to tell about it. And so I, I appreciate that part of my life. So here I'm 85 and I've just written a book and I'm still working. And last night at four in the morning, I, I got an idea for a song and so I stood up, stayed up for an hour and finished my song. Because only two weeks ago I got a call from the um, Rotary Club in Wilmington, Delaware. They have been meeting for 100 years in the Gold Ballroom at the Hotel DuPont since 1914. And for 20 years I directed, um, well I was their pianist and their song leader. I got an idea to write a short song for every speaker they had. And I would pick a song, a tune that everybody knew that had something to do with the speaker's subject and then I would write a lyrics and put a, type them up and put them by each person's dinner table. And, and they would be, oh, 200 people there. And they'd all sing. And, and the speakers would say, oh, my goodness, nobody's ever sung a song to me. This is amazing. See, Well, now they said, Evelyn, we need you to come back. I hadn't been there for about 10 years because my husband became ill and he died recently. And so now I had a blank slate. And I wondered, what, what am I going to do with my life now? And then I thought about, I met Jim Thompson. Uh, he came to my house and I said, and how do you happen to be here? Because you're from Alexandria, Virginia, and you, ha you have a book uh, publishing company. And he said, well, yes. Um, and I said, well, I know one person from Alexandria. His name is Sumter Pretty the Third, and he's a, an antique dealer. And he said, well, of course I know him because he was my brother's roommate at UVA. See, everybody I meet, there's somebody that I know that you know. And that's been the fun and the exciting part of my life. So, um, as I said, I, I went to um, old Grand Ole Opry, but I also saw all those other famous people, and I can do a Minnie Pearl impersonation too. I used to have my costume and my, my, my price tag, and I'd say, Howdy! Just so proud to be here! Just so proud I could come! So, um, so it's fun to pretend to be other people, and you forget your own problems when you can do that. Um, after I graduated from Hollins College at age 20, the day after I got married, had two daughters and two sons, then I traveled with the DuPont Company, Waynesboro, Virginia, Seaford, Delaware, Camden, South Carolina, and every place I went, there was something that I needed to do, that they needed somebody to do, and so my theme was always this favorite little jingle of mine called, um, oh, it's, um, she shall have music wherever she goes. You know, ride a cock horse to Banbury Cross to see a fine lady upon a white horse. Rings on her fingers and bells on her toes. She shall have music wherever she goes. And so uh, in these small towns where there were DuPont nylon plants, there was really not much going on because there wasn't anybody to direct things. 
And so I would get all the choirs together in the whole county, wherever I was, and we would do the Messiah and Elijah and all those big choral pieces. Well, I just loved doing that. And of course, the whole town loved it, and the whole town came out, and they were all free because I didn't charge anything. And I just borrowed the, the music and got the soloists, and it, it worked out. Uh, one interesting thing, when I did Elijah, uh, I had four little children all at home, and I was doing a radio show. They even came to my house and recorded it. <laughs> Uh, because I, I didn't have a car to go to where they were, uh, and it was WBOC in Salisbury, Maryland, but they came to Seaford, Delaware, and I played the piano and sang and talked about different composers for a half hour every week, and I really loved that. And so when I was going to do Elijah, the, the black lady who w w helped me, and I really needed help because these were three, three kids in three years and then the, the next one. So um, she said, well, may I come? And I said, well, of course, it's free and open to the public. And so um, she said, well, could I bring the people from my church? I said, well, of course, because it's free and open to the public. So they all came. And do you know, I was new in town. I didn't even realize that they had never set foot in the high school. But they all came, and there were no tickets, and there were no ushers, so they all went upstairs, and they filled the whole balcony. And one lady, a teacher in the black school, wrote me a letter. I never met her, because we, we moved right after that. And when we left, we came to, to live in Chad's Ford, PA, because I wanted my, my children had been in small towns. They, they were not comfortable being in the big schools in Wilmington. So we said, well, we'll go to Chad's Ford. And I wanted to go to Westchester. So I went to Westchester at age 40, and I had a wonderful time. And uh, well, anyway, my children um, were singing when they were this big. But when they came to Elijah, they said, well, why are all these people here? And I said, because I invited them. I mean, everybody can come. This lady wrote me a letter, and I had them stacks of letters in boxes in my attic up in Chad's Ford. And when we moved down to a retirement home, it just broke my heart to think I can't take all these things with me. So I had my daughters go up and clean up the attic. And when they took all the letters to burn, I went up with a broom to sweep. And do you know, I found one letter turned over, left. It was from this black teacher and it's the most beautiful letter I've ever gotten in my life. And when, when we had the book planned, and my children called me about it, and my son said, you know, Mom, you gotta put that letter in uh, about Mrs. Watson, because that's the best thing you ever did in your whole life. So I've got very supportive children. My son is now a surgeon in Oregon. And he used to play French horn in the marching band. He played, um, what, you can't play it, uh, you play something else, I've forgotten, the, the instrument. Um, and um, my other son lives in Tampa, Florida, and he went down there on a golf scholarship. My two daughters live in North Carolina. One's a director of an art museum, and the other one uh, has her own interior design business, and they're, I've got four grandchildren and four great-grandchildren. Uh, two weeks ago, <clears throat> I spent a week in, in Vienna, Austria. One of my daughters and her husband were going to a convention. Uh, two weeks before that, I went to my high school reunion, class of 45, and was honored as a distinguished alumna. Can you believe it? My two daughters came. My, my sister married my husband's brother, and she, her two daughters came, so it was big. I hadn't seen, I hadn't been to Tennessee in 10 years. And then a month after that, I went back to Hollins to my college reunion, 49, and I was honored as a distinguished alumna. Only three people from my class were able to come. The first thing they said when they called me was the president said, and uh, will you be able to come? <laughs> uh, and I said, yes, so I did. And then I went to Austria, you see? So now, here I am. I've got a brand new BMW 
because my son in Tampa sells BMWs. And he says, Mom, he says, Mom, you've got to, to join the human race. You, you, need a, you need a GPS because you're going to have all these book signings and you need to know where you're going. And I'm going back to all these towns where, uh, where I used to live and because and, people are, from there are in my book. And so that's a lot of fun. So, you know, I just keep reinventing my life. I, I don't know how it happens, it just does. And so um, now I've got a GPS and then I've got a smartphone and I'm just beginning to learn how to use it and it's very uh, tense. <laughs> I'm very tense, but, uh, but I know I'm going to, to learn how to do it. So uh, as long as I have the energy and the health, I'm just gonna keep on learning new things. Now, I'm gonna need to tell you about this guy. Um, I met him through my daughter, who was director of an art museum in South Carolina. And um, when he was starting the Spoleto Festival in Charleston, South Carolina, he was going around to all these little towns to tell people what it was, and it's coming. And so I went to see an opera there. And I went up afterwards, and my daughter said, well, Mr. Minotti, my mother has been singing and conducting your, your music for years and years. And I said, and when are you going to write another one that has a children's chorus and adult opera singers? See, that's what I did at Opera Delaware for 33 years. I was the director of education, but I ran out of things to do. So I just asked people to write more things for me or I wrote them myself. So I ended up writing 12 musicals that have been produced uh, in Wilmington and now they're published and people are doing them all around the country. Ah, so I've even been to Scotland to visit his home there. And it was funny, I went with some golfers and I got to play St. Andrews. But uh, one of the wives looked through his bio that was on the coffee table and she said, my goodness, you really do know him. <laughs> so um, I've got a lot of famous people that are in my book. Mary Higgins Clark has written a blurb to put on the back of the next printing because I did one of her musicals. Do you know Sheldon Harnick who wrote the lyrics for uh, Fiddler on the Roof? I've done one of his shows and he took me to New York and to see... Um, what was it, She Loves Me on Broadway, and guess who was the star? The girl from Wilmington, who in 1974 was Dorothy in my first production of The Wizard of Oz for Opera Delaware. So, thank you very much. Thank you, so let's do some Q&A. Um, I'd like to kick it off and, and just ask you, about your habits and how you keep creativity alive. You said you woke up at four. Is that something that, you, that you've always just followed or do you, do you treat creativity in a very deliberate way? And I'd like to hear. Well, um, people keep asking me, how, where do you get these ideas? And um, I've always been a choir director wherever I've been. And I always believe that, um, um, if God made my brain, he's sending me messages. So even before there was computers, I called it capital G mail. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what else to call it. Uh, because uh, last night before I went to bed, I made a list. Well, somebody sent me on computer uh, to um, what Rotary stands for and what they have done in the past and what they're planning to do in the future. And so they want me to write, and it's all flowery language, all long words, you, you can imagine. And it's long, and then they want me to, to write a song that everybody in the club can sing. Half of them can't even carry a tune. <laughs> so I, I went to bed thinking about that, and then I woke up and I thought, I know the tune I'm gonna use and the first line fits. And it's 100 years of rotary, we're celebrating here today. Well, everybody can sing that, you see? Yeah. Okay. And all the rhymes are day and, and play and may and all that, and at the end it's hooray, you know, like that. Yeah. And it's George M. Cohan, thank you, sir. It's because it's a song, everybody, the tune. Do you all know that tune? 
Some of you do, some of you do. Well, I mean, <laughs> the movie about his life was on last week on <laughs> the, uh, the, the old movies channel. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it's, I've got all ages in the club, so I had to find something easy. So that's what I got up and wrote, because it only needs eight measures. So I imagine, though, that that happens regularly, that yes, you get yes. up and you get to work. Yeah, because I get ideas and I have a piece of paper and a pencil next to my bed. I always have. And then I write down things because I don't want to forget it yeah, when yeah. I wake up. So some people in culture would, would say, oh, too many ideas, that's a problem, you've got to do some of them. But I read this interesting thing about Apple and that ecosystem around um, the park that uh, this was like pre, maybe pre-Apple. There was a research park somewhere, I'm looking at Palo Alto. Yeah, in Palo Alto. And a New Yorker writer dug into the data and his, his thesis was that they didn't just have great ideas, they had more ideas than, than your average person and it's through the volume that you get the best one. So, which, turn, which is counterintuitive, I think, to general culture. So, I like the fact that you posit that you just got to grab all the ideas, right? You don't know which one's going to be the best one, but you just got to grab them all and document them. Oh, yes, and now that I'm living at a, a retirement community, uh, they don't have anything going on. I mean, they didn't when I came, <laughs> before I came. And I just figured, well, uh, it's interesting because about 15 years before I came to this place, there were two women that went to Holland's College and they had a chorus and they did uh, musical programs. And then they had, didn't have anything for 20 years and so I said, well, I'm, I'm here and I suppose it's my turn to continue to carry on what these women started. And so I'm, I got a chorus together and then we did a program for the 4th of July and then I got my brass group from Aldersgate Church. See, besides Aldersgate, I mean, Opera Delaware, I was 33 years at Opera Dela Aldersgate Methodist Church. I had a choir of 80 people and an orchestra and a brass group, and so I kept bringing them. Mm -hmm. And for the last five years, I've conducted the Brandywine Pops Orchestra. So when I came to Wilmington, I was the first woman to do everything. I just happened to hit it at the right time. The first woman to conduct the Delaware Symphony, the first woman to conduct the Opera Delaware, and the Brandywiners, and the Arden Singers, and you know, the brandy winers at Longwood Gardens. So the first go around, I, I sang the lead with all these groups, and then I got my master's at Westchester, and then I conducted all these groups. So, you know, if you keep learning, you keep finding things to do, or other people find you. Yeah. All right, enough of me. Uh, you introduce yourself, please. Uh, my name is Kyle Hudson from Digital Exhibition Systems. Um, what was the, I mean, it seems like you've had lots of success, but what was, um, like, a, a really tough, Part and how did you uh, really tough thing that you hurdle that you had to get over and how did you get over it? Well, you know, people have asked me that because I didn't find any discrimination against women because I was always in a place where they needed me and there wasn't a man who would do it for free. That's the point. I mean, I got all these jobs because uh, I didn't ask any money. Uh, I didn't. I just didn't. Yes. And so uh, everything opened to me. Well, of course, then I got paid anyway when I got here because I had a whole list of things I had conducted in small towns. And that was my entree. Uh, that's, uh, I saw an article on LinkedIn recently about why you should work for free. And every time I've jumped into something new, you always have to do something for free, right? Like, you can't just get paid for what you love and what you want. Well, and when the people don't have any money to pay you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so that's good, good answer. Yeah. Um, I understand that you've written a number of musicals yourself at, at Delaware Opera. Was, it, was each experience very similar or was it always a different kind of experience for each thing that you wrote and wrote? Oh, well, you see, uh, at one time I wanted to get the schools to bus their students to come to the Grand to see our productions. And so when I took over, we were doing, I mean, I was um, conducting operas based on works by famous people like Ravel, The Bewitched Boy, or L'Enfant et les Sortilèges. They did do at the Met. 
I mean, I had opera singers there. I had Alan Wagner and Joy Vandiver and all these people from Westchester. They were music teachers, and they were in all my shows, and the students were in my shows. Um, and so Westchester was really my ground for finding talent. And I loved working with all those people, and they're all in my book and their pictures. And Alan Wagner, who was head of the music department, uh, voice part, w was um, in 30 productions. But the books that I made into musicals were chosen by teachers in the school. I got a group of educators to meet with me, and, I, and some were um, like teachers, some were administrators, and said, okay, what books are you teaching in the school and which ones would make good musicals? Which one would you bus your students to see? Because that means a whole afternoon, you know. Well, we got together and they helped me choose. Every year we would choose a different musical. And my gosh, um, the first one I wrote was The Enormous Egg about a boy whose chicken hatches a dinosaur and he has to go to Washington to figure out how to get Congress to, to, uh, to give him money to pay for the dinosaur in the zoo, you know, for food. And so it's, it's a learning experience and the author's whole family came down by bus from New Hampshire. I mean, uh, it was just such an exciting thing. We did it at the Kennedy Center and I had our congressman and our senator in the show and they played themselves. One against and one for the dinosaur. You know, one says, well, let him die and let him be extinct like all the other dinosaurs. And then the other one would say, oh no, we have to save him because he's one of a kind. And now there is a big statue of that dinosaur, life size, in the Washington Zoo. <laughs> I mean, so isn't that amazing? And another book they chose was um, the, um, let's see, it's about two children who run away from home in Connecticut and hide in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The mixed up files of Mrs. Basil E. Frankweiler. And I wrote that, and do you know, we did it at the Metropolitan Museum of Art because they have now, a, a tour of the museum and it takes families and kids all around to where the certain scenes happened and they go to the Egyptian muse uh, part and I had to write Egyptian music, you know, and then early music, uh, contrapuntal, unaccompanied. I mean, everything just had a reason. And, and then how would they get from the bus station all the way up to the museum. They didn't have enough money to, to get a cab or a bus, so they had to walk. So now how am I going to put that on stage? Well, I figured out that um, there was an election going on in, in uh, New York at that same time. And our uh, head of our opera company looked just like him. So I had a big so song to New York. And, uh, and the, it was reviewed in Opera News, all my shows were, from, from the Met. And he just said, it's the sweetheart song to New York, the best song ever written about New York. Well, gee, you know a lot of songs about New York, but he liked mine better. <laughs> so, I mean, every one of my shows was a book, and 6,000 kids came to the Grand to see my shows. But now, in 2007 was my last show because the, the money was leaving Opera Delaware. The schools didn't have money to bus their school kids in, so it's all, it's all gone. But I was there for a beautiful ride for 33 years, and I appreciate it, and I got to tell about it. And that's because my husband, all, we've been married, mar we're married 65 years, and, and before he died that whole last year, I would go and feed him and then come back to my cottage and write. And he kept statu books like this big, 20 of them, with all the pictures and all the reviews and everything that I did. It was a labor of love, and he knew I was writing the book. So we wrote it together. Nice. Um, I just wanted to take a quick poll and raise your hand if you went to Westchester, graduated from Westchester, or going to Westchester. I like that you posit that it's an ecosystem that you drew on to really make a lot of stuff happen for you. Oh, yes, yes. I'm amazed at your resourcefulness. You're like a, a, a real startup character in a way. Like you bootstrapped, you found a way to take whatever you had and put it together and make something more out of it. 
right? Mm -hmm. And also the idea that you went into the schools and you got buy-in before you started production, right? You went into the, you found your customers and then you built the product, right? right? So that they were automatically in. Sounds familiar, right. Kevin and, and Michael. Uh, so we have a couple more minutes and then after you'll be able to add, uh, mingle, get some more coffee and water. Andrew, introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Andrew Schwab. I'm an entrepreneur and also a musician. Oh, good. Um, what do you play or sing? I play guitar. I sing a little bit. I write a little bit about music. I also play percussion, bass. I play by oh. ear, so I kind of adapt to it. Well, good. Thank you. like um, to hear you sometime. My question is, is that I'm sure you've faced times where you've been either in a rut or had writer's block. And do you have any nuggets of wisdom of how you've been able to beat and push through uh, the writer's block? Uh, in order to get things back on track for a deadline or, or anything like that? I think my secret is that I pick good books. <laughs> because the way to write a musical in, in the, that I've done that's worked, you get a really good book. And then you, make a, you write a play out of it with dialogue and stage directions. And then you figure out where uh, somebody would be singing a song, whether it's a group or somebody, a soliloquy, or how they're feeling, or something like that. And then you sort of get into to that person, and then you see how they change their thinking when they're singing by themselves. Like even the dinosaur, he had a solo when nobody else was listening, you see. Uh, but it was how he was feeling, a one of a kind. Um, so I didn't have any writer's block because I already had the source now, when you're starting to write something from nothing, that's when it's tough. But see, I, I didn't have it that tough. And see, you're trying to create it from the beginning, from, from nothing. And that's harder. So I salute you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I grew up um, reading A Wrinkle Andrew? in Time. Oh, well, okay. yeah. I'm Ben. I'm a community evangelist and manager. Oh, and A Wrinkle in Time. And, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I want to hear um, what your work was um, associated with A Wrinkle in Time. Oh, well, that's one I conducted, but I didn't write because I read in the Wall Street Journal an article about um, Libby Larson, L-A-R-S-E-N, who uh, has been to Westchester to do big master classes and everything with uh, composers. And, uh, and I called her, and she said, uh, where did you say you're calling from? And I said, Wilmington, Delaware. She said, well, I was born there. My father worked for DuPont. I didn't even know that. <laughs> and then I said, would you be willing to come and talk to us about writing a, a musical based? And she said, well, I certainly would. So she came. We gave her four books. She read all four living in the Hotel DuPont one night, came in the next morning and said, I want to do A Wrinkle in Time because the children are the heroes. It is about outer space. And so that means it, never, it w will not run out of uh, interest because it's, th it's the future. It's a futuristic uh, kind of idea. And uh, so it was very, very modern music and very difficult. And that's the hardest thing that I've ever had to conduct. Because she had, had a chorus, and we did it at the Hotel DuPont in the Playhouse. Uh, and there was a chorus in front of the stage, in the boxes on either side. And they all wore black and had masks. And, and here I was in my black tails uh, conducting. It was weird. It was really weird. <laughs> uh, but the kids were just all agog. I mean, it, it was very, very interesting. It's never been done again. <laughs> but uh, it's scheduled to be done uh, next year uh, at Fort Worth Opera. And they're cooperating with the University of Kentucky that has a master's degree in sound effects. <coughs> And that's what we needed, it was, see, uh, because you've got to fly people and you've got to do all these special things. And so I'm looking forward to that, as I've already told. And she wrote a blurb on the, for the back of my next printing, too, of my book. So um, thank you for asking about that. Yeah, of course. Anybody before I ask another one? Uh, so it sounds like you've been in charge of raising or um, raising money or bringing resources to make these projects go. So it's That's right. into fundraising. 
how have you approached that? Uh, do you go for the heart, or uh, how have you been able to clearly, effectively, you've done it, uh, get people to jump on board and help you in these? Ah, uh, but you see, I was fortunate that I could be the artist, the musician, the composer, the conductor, and somebody else raised the money. We got money from the State Arts Council. Like I now am paid by the Delaware Humanities Forum. It's the, the Arts Council. Uh, they're two different national organizations that get money from the government. And so that's, that's how we did it. There were always a few people Oh, I know. When, um, when I wanted to have Minotti come and write, he came to the first rehearsal. He hadn't written a note. He said, but he had already told me the story, and he said, don't tell anybody. But I need a nice place to stay. So I remembered when I did Amal and the Night Visitors at the Grand, a lady came up in a big black hat, gloves, everything, and she said, uh, here's my card if you ever need help please call me, and it was a Mrs. DuPont, Mrs. Felix DuPont. I'd never met her, but I found out later she had given free tickets to every crippled child in the state of Delaware to come to my production of Amal and the Night Visitors. And so I called her and I said, uh, Marka, I need your help. I need a place for Giancarlo Minotti to stay for a week while he writes this opera. He wrote it in, seven, in six days. And seven days, uh, he rested. <laughs> and every morning, I would go to her house, and he would give me what he had written the night before. And then I would go to a copy shop, and they even put a plaque on that copy copier saying, um, John Carlo's opera was, was printed here. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, it was just very interesting that she said to her husband when I walked in and, and talked to her about it, Oh, isn't it wonderful? We're going to have another composer in the house. Doesn't it remind you of when George was writing the, uh, the, the uh, orchestrations for Porgy and Beth in our house down in Palm Beach? I mean, see, so I put that in my book, and you know, my editor said, you have to put Gershwin because people won't know who you're talking about. <laughs> well, anyway. Uh, uh, last question. The title of your book is uh, or was, it had the word serendipity in it. I know. It was too long. My editor thought of that. So the word is in there, but that's really the, the word that expresses, I guess, my life because do you know what that word means and how they got it? Well, I want to know. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, there was a, a fairy tale in France about the, the brothers of serendip. I don't know how you say it in French. But, but that's the word. And they were always finding things that they were not even looking for. And that's how they made the word. Serendipity it, or serendipitous. And so uh, that's really what my life is all about. But it's a too big a word to put in a title. But and your, your book is just full of moments where you happen to run into somebody and run into That I, that I wasn't looking for, yeah. A couple of weeks ago to start a meetup, I, I don't know who I was talking to, but they bumped into somebody in a parking lot and had a conversation, and that triggered something that oh, led yeah. to where he is. And I surmise that innovators are open to the random occurrence that these things might seem random, but you should consider them. Whereas a lot of people filter out. They're so focused, they filter out a lot of serendipity. So have you, have you had that as a specific value or mindset in your life, or is it just the way you are? I think I, I like people, and I'm always interested in where they're from and what they do and how they think. And so I, I know I went to lunch with a couple women the other day in a French restaurant. And the waiter was a young fellow that looked foreign. I mean, he did look American anyway. And I knew that the woman who owned that restaurant uh, had been married to a Frenchman that's in my Rotary Club. And so I thought, well, this might be their son. you know? Cause, so I wasn't going to pass up the opportunity. I said, oh, are, are you from France? And he said, uh, no, I'm from Russia. And then. We started talking. We had a very nice conversation. And when he left, 
and I gave him a tip, and then the girl said, you know, I don't know why, you're just never afraid to talk to strangers. And I said, well, I don't think anybody's a stranger to me. I, I just want to know who they are. And yeah. so I'm, <laughs> that's how it happens. I just go and talk to people. Well, like Lynn you. here. I knew that she had been to South America. I looked at her jacket. Mm -hmm. So there's always something that can start a conversation. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Great story. <laughs>